Getting back a stop of clipped highlight detail sound like something you'd like to be able to do? Well, doing just that is what I'll be looking at in this video. What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. This is the third and final part in my three-part mini-series covering ways you can expand the dynamic range in your images. And this time, I'm looking at a novel trick that you can do with Canon's DP RAW format that allows you to recover one stop of highlight detail. Granted, one stop is not a lot, but it can be enough in some situations. This technique and the free program you'll need for it was discovered by the people over at LibRaw LLC, or at least they're the first people I saw who published it. And for those who, inter those who are interested, I'll talk a little bit about why this works at the end of the video. But first, let's focus on what you need to know to use it. The good news is that the only thing you have to do in the field to make this work is turn on dual pixel raw mode. And of course, you'll find this setting on the Shoot One menu page. If you've never used Dual Pixel RAW before, it's probably worth talking a little bit about what you can and can't do with it in general. So Dual Pixel RAW mode primarily serves to enable post-processing operations both in the camera and in Canon's Digital Photo Professional software. In camera, you can make use of portrait relighting and background clarity adjustments, while in DPP, you can make focus micro adjustments, shift the background bokeh, and remove some types of ghosting. As an aside, it's a little frustrating to me that DP RAW doesn't get the love I think it deserves, and the extent of its usefulness remains limited even in Canon's own tools. For example, the files have all the information needed to generate focus or depth maps, and that could be used for much smarter focus stacking or depth-based masking for, of adjustments such as can be done in Lightroom with Apple's RAW files. And of course, there's the highlight recovery capability that we're talking about here. That said, there are some downsides to shooting in DP RAW as well. To start with, dual pixel RAW files are twice the size of the standard RAW file, though with the combination of CRAW compression and modern high capacity memory cards, this isn't much of an issue. Secondly, they require more bandwidth to read the extra data from the sensor, process it, and write it to the card. Consequently, the maximum frame rate is limited to three frames per second, or the equivalent of continuous low. Finally, some settings are incompatible with DP RAW mode and will just be unavailable. These include multiple exposures, HDR shooting, fully electronic shutter, and one-touch image quality setting. That said, compared to exposure bracketing and stacking, there is at least one key benefit to this technique, and that's that it's a single frame process. This means that there's no risk of moving subjects, artifacting, or having to wait for multiple images to be captured. With all that said, I don't view this process as a direct replacement for shooting an auto exposure bracket stack. Instead, I see it as a tool to keep in my back pocket for those situations where I want a little extra protection from clipping highlight highlights. For instance, I'll often enable DP RAW when I'm shooting landscapes with snow-capped mountains or other really bright areas. I'll still aim to expose the images properly. However, given how reflective snow is, it poses a real challenge to manage without clipping, and this gives me a little extra protection. With the camera side of things out of the way, let's look at the post-processing. You'll need to download and install the free software DPR Split, which I've linked in the description below for this process. This software extracts the part of the DP RAW file that contains the lower brightness information and saves it as a DNG file. From there, you bring that file into the and the original DP RAW file into any multi-shot HDR stacking program, and you get your final results. DPR Split itself is a pretty simple program, but let's quickly run through it anyway. The topmost section of the window tells DPR Split what images to process. You can either use the input folder button to pick a folder where your images are saved, or you can drag and drop individual DP RAW image files or a folder of them on the DPR Split app to tell it where to find them. This next section controls how the images will be processed. In the processing type dropdown, you can choose whether to extract both subframes as DNGs or only the second subframe with the reduced exposure information. If your HDR software doesn't know how to deal with DP RAW files, you'll want to extract both. Otherwise, you can just extract the second. 
The skip processing if not overexposed checkbox will skip extracting the second subframe if there are fewer than a thousand clip pixels in the main frame. I suggest leaving this checked to save the space and processing time as honestly a thousand pixels is inconsequential when talking about 20 megapixel files, never mind 45 megapixel ones. The other checkbox, adjust EXIF shutter speed to by minus one EV for second frame, that's a mouthful, controls whether the exposure information is adjusted in the extracted second frame or if it will be copied over and remain the same as the exposure information in the source file. Some HDR software uses the EXIF data to determine what exposures of each, or what the exposure is of each frame, and this ensures that those programs properly handle the new file. Personally, I leave it checked. The next section in the window controls where files are, where the new files are saved. So I save them in the same location as the source images and I skip creating files that already exist. This also helps me get the images back into Lightroom. The final section controls how the new files will be named. So I use the original file name with a frame suffix of dash A or dash B. You could also use dash one or dash two. However, typically programs append numbers to duplicate files that are similar to this and that could get confusing. This is very much a season to your own taste setting. So look at the options that are available and check what they're doing with the file name preview and pick something that works for you. Finally, when, you get to every, when you've got everything set to your liking, click either the Analyze or Analyze and Convert All button. Clicking Analyze will present you with a list of files that would be converted and allows you to pick the ones you want to convert individually. Otherwise, Analyze and Convert All just converts everything that can be converted automatically. Of course, the final step in all of this is to bring the two files into your favorite HDR app and combine them. Now, as a bonus, if you use Lightroom, as long as you save in the same location as the original, you can just sync that folder in Lightroom and the new images will show up in your library next to the originals. So on the scales of utility and difficulty, this isn't the most extensive way to extend the camera's dynamic range. Exposure bracketing will absolutely allow you to cover a much wider range. Likewise, the software situation does require a bit of jumping through hoops to make it, which makes it more of a pain than it should be. That said, in many ways, I find this technique is more useful to me in more situations than stacking, if only as an extra safety net to save the highlights in tricky situations. There's no real setup, and for the most part, you can ignore the DP raw aspect of the files when you don't need it. The only real cost I've seen in practice is the slower frame rate when shooting. However, that's not at all a huge issue for me in landscape photography, which is where I find this technique most useful anyway. At the beginning of this video, I said I'd talk a little about why and how this works. So according to the folks at LibRAW, this works like this. In a dual pixel sensor, each active pixel is divided into two photo detectors or subpixels. The two detectors can then be read independently, which is how the camera focuses, or combined to act like one larger pixel. For standard RAW files, the two subpixels are combined and saved as the image data. However, in dual pixel RAW mode, the RAW file stores two separate subframes. The first of these subframes is identical to the standard RAW file, the sum of the two subpixels. However, the second subframe contains only the data from one of the subpixels. Because a subpixel only covers half of the pixel area, it only collects half of the pixel's light, and therefore has an exposure one stop lower than the full pixel's exposure. You can think of this as somewhat analogous to the aperture stop in a lens. If you reduce the area of the aperture stop by half, you reduce the light that can pass through it by half, or one stop. Incidentally, the ratio of change in area is the square root of two, or 1.414 and a whole bunch of more numbers, which you might also recognize is the multiple between the F numbers. So for example, 1, 1 1.4, 2, 2.8, etc. In case you ever wondered where those numbers are coming from and why. So if you found this video interesting or at least a little form informative, please smash that like button to let me know. Also, please consider subscribing. 
And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.